I'm happy for questions to go beyond what was in that talk as well. You know, sort of whatever you want to talk about is, I think, fair game. Happy, please. Yeah. Um, hello, um, I'm Hithvi. Hi. Uh, my question was, so in your talk, you talk about how having flexible methods also leads to like, makes it harder to reproduce science and to reproduce the results. But I always also almost thought of the fact that if we have different methods and we can get at the same results, then it almost makes those results more robust. Um, so I was wondering how you would strike a balance between standardizing, but also um, increasing the robustness of results by trying out different methods. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. That you know, when we um, when we think about like why we believe a particular result, if you can get to the same result in lots of different ways, then that's much. Especially if those ways are you know more different from one another, sort of more independent from one another, that leads us to think that it's a more robust result. So that's that's exactly the right intuition. And the question is like, how do we you know how do we achieve that right? Um, so I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily want to, you know, say that everybody should standardize on a particular pipeline, right? Now, in some places, I think that makes sense. Like, I think for pre-processing, it's not clear to me that there's kind of, you know, there's enough impact of most of the ways that we do pre-processing that would sort of override the benefits you get of, you know, standardizing pre-processing. I think for modeling, especially for statistical modeling, I think that we have to worry a lot about um, you know whether our results will survive particular modeling uh, uh, choices. And so you know we've been thinking a lot about how to implement you know what people are starting to call multiverse analysis, right where instead of analyzing a data one a data set one way, you analyze it in a bunch of different ways. Um, but the, you know, the point is you're not trying to find the one that gives you a good result. You're trying to basically ask, what are the results that are consistent? I mean, you can sort of think about it as like, you know, doing a meta analysis across a bunch of analyses, right? And asking basically what's, um, what, what's, what's robust to all these differences in, in modeling. Um, now that's challenging, right? Because that, requires that you're able to basically take a data set and run lots of different analyses and be able to just sort of track all that. So one, one thing we've been working on in the lab for a while is um, trying to come up with ways to be able to allow people to run statistical models in a more automated way. And so there's really two parts of this. One is being able to sort of write down what, uh, what the statistical model is in a way that isn't necessarily tied to a particular software package, right? So right now, you know, you can, like, if you want to run your thing in SPM, you can write an SPM batch file. If you want to run it in FSL, you can write a, you know, FSL script, whatever. Um, but we've, so we started a few years ago, this project that was really carried forward by, uh, by Tal Yarkoni and, and subsequently been taken over by Chris Markovitz in my lab um, called the BID Statistical Models Framework. So you're all, I assume you're all familiar with BIDs at this point, you know, and BIDs has mostly been focused in the past on, um, on you know, raw data or then sort of the results, like just derivatives from raw data. Um, what the bid statistical models framework tries to do is basically provide a way to write down what the model looks like in terms of like, you know, what are all the regressors that go into the model? What are the confounds? What kind of convolution do you want to do? You know, things like that. Um, and that framework is almost ready for prime time. It's in kind of a release candidate right now and hopefully will be accepted by the bids community within the next few months. Um, and then in, in parallel, Chris Markovitz uh, in our group has been developing a package called FitLens, which basically the idea is it takes a bids data set and it takes one of these um, bid statistical modeling uh, files, a file that describes the model, and basically goes and runs the model. And you have to tell it a little bit more about, you know, like what particular software to use. Um, but the idea would be, you know, to have a way to be able to relatively straightforwardly run lots of different models in parallel. Obviously, you have to do this on a supercomputer because it can take a lot of processing power. Um, but um, that's the way that we're thinking about it, is really being able to like, you know, run lots of models and then 
collapse over them and ask like what's robust or and also to ask like you know if there are there systematic relationships between particular modeling choices like are there particular things that like fall away if you model head motion in a particular way or if you model reaction time in a particular way on task fMRI data set and so on Right. Um, I, can I follow up just a question? It must be really tempting to say, hey, we have here a, a language to describe statistical models. Let's just, you know, boil the whole ocean and describe all the possible statistical models for all the possible, you know, data that, you know, right. you might come against. And how do you how do you avoid doing that? And Or are you avoiding doing that? Yeah, I mean, well, I think there's going to be, you know, there's a amongst all the possible models, there's a pretty small subset, I think that would make sense scientifically, right? So we wanna focus on, and obviously we have to make some choices. Like, you know, we think based on our previous work that things like confound modeling and reaction time modeling, um, or, it, it, and, you know, a few other sort of aspects of how one models, for example, parametric regressors, you know, our previous work, like the NARPS project has suggested to us that those are things that might make a particularly big difference. Um, and so that's where we're focusing, but it's, you know, it, it requires, yeah, I think we're not going to boil the ocean, you know, one, because we would like the, the, all the computing it would take to do that would literally boil the ocean. <laughs> Let's see what, what other questions do people have? I can ask a question. I have a, a socio-technical question, okay. which relates somewhat to your to things you mentioned in your talk about working with you know large teams and large groups of people with large data sets. I, for example, I spend a lot of my time in, in, in this course. We're actually spending a lot of our time working on all these open data sets mm -hmm. that are out there. And there the, the, the it's a bit tricky, right? Because everyone else also has access to these data sets. So how do you decide, how do you think about how you reason about deciding what questions to ask from the data that you won't run into conflict with other groups who are also running the same, asking similar questions and how do, how do we coordinate as a community to, to do this in a way that everyone can retain their sanity? Um. I mean, I, well, the, I'm not sure coordination is the right way to think about it, right? You know, in, in some sense, you know, having different people trying different things on the same data can be useful, right, to make sure that we all, you know, in the context of the previous question, to make sure that we all come up with the same answers, even though we're coming at it from different ways. But you're right that it, um, you know, especially in, you know, areas that are very fast moving, you can have lots of people working on the same data. Like right now with the ABCD data set, you know, we, we published a paper last year, I think last year, earlier this year that showed, you know, some issues with how the stop signal task had been implemented in the ABCD data set. So now there's a bunch of different people trying to, you know, sort of go after that and think about different ways to deal with it. And, um, and it's, you know, especially for somebody who, you know, where this is like, you know, one of their projects for their dissertation or you know, their graduate work, having like 10 other groups working on the same thing and feeling like you're in a race with them can be you know, pretty frightening. Um, and I don't know, you know, that's a challenging thing to deal with because you know, I think um, you know, we've sometimes tried to work with other groups uh, you know, in these sorts of situations, but in general, um, you know, I'm not sure that that's the the best way to do it. So there, so that that's one issue is just the the anxiety around like you know being in a race. Um, the you know another issue we wrote a paper last year about what we call data set decay, which is sort of a related issue, right? Which is that when lots of people are you know kind of taking these data sets and beating on them, you know, at some point you're going to have a lot of papers that could well be you know basically false positives, right? Um, and, um, and so thinking about, you know, how to, you know, how to address that concern, you know, so for example, take the human connectome project, right? Those data sets have been used in probably well over a thousand papers at this point. 
Um, and even if we assume like no p hacking, right, that everybody just you know took the data set and did their one analysis and wrote a paper on how that one analysis that they had planned and you know potentially pre-registered how that came out. We know that didn't happen in, in pretty much any of those <laughs> papers actually. But even if that had happened, you know, then we would have a you know some decent and if everybody was like you know correctly controlling type one error, you'd have you know. 50 papers out there that are that are false positives right um and we know that in reality the number is probably much higher than that because of p hacking because of analytic flexibility um and um and so that's another concern i think is just the the you know as somebody who's been a, a real advocate for open data it's you know it was weird for me to write a paper basically saying hey here's a problem with open data um, and, you know, what we'd love is for people to sort of, you know, pre-register everything that they do. So at least we have some, you know, protection against uh, analytic flexibility and p-hacking, but, um, but that hasn't happened for the most part. Um, it's funny, I've been, you know, I was the, the head of the external advisory board for the Human Connectome Project, and I'm on the advisory board for the ABCD data, uh, the ABCD project. And, in both cases, I pushed hard to get them to basically try to get people to pre-register their analyses before they got their hands on the data. Um, the HCP just wasn't having it at all. The ABCD had acted like they were going to include it. And I don't know if it actually ended up, I don't think it ever ended up in any of the, the workflows, which is unfortunate um, because, you know, that's a, that's a huge data set, right? Where um, it's really easy. Like basically, if you're doing null hypothesis testing, anything you do with 10,000 subjects is going to find significant results, right? Um, now, fortunately, the the plus of working with 10,000 subjects is that the you know the the the, the variability of the of the results is is lower, right? So you're less likely to just randomly find a uh, uh, um, a, a false positive result, but um, but there's going to be you know lots of there's going to be lots of papers written with lots of you know p less than 0 0.05 results on ten thousand subjects. Sweet, please. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hey. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to discuss these issues with us. Uh, I, one of the ideas that I uh, heard over time regarding this uh, specific issue was basically, um, I'm not sure what's the right word, tolling, like taking a, a toll from uh, labs or users. So they have to pay in subjects <laughs> when they uh, download the data set. So there is decay, but you're basically um, putting a, a force against that decay by slowly building up the data set more and more. Huh. I was wondering, um, it's like the sort of weird altruistic capitalistic model, I guess. Uh, I was wondering um, what you what you think about this idea. And I mean, it, it opposes open science on, on you know, one hand, but then promotes it on the other. And, I find it's an interesting idea. I was wondering. It is, a, yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen that actually done anywhere. So it is a really interesting idea, and I think it, more generally, the idea of you know sort of um, recognizing that you know that people probably do need to bear some type of cost that you know that data don't just show up on their doorstep for free, right? You know, we like in the Open Neuro project, you know, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year maintaining and building that project, right? Um, and that doesn't even count all the time that, of the people actually giving, you know, putting the data in, right? That's just to keep the 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 wheels on the on the thing, keep it keep it rolling. Um, and you know, we've been lucky that this has been sort of, you know, covered by NIH, but that may not go on forever, right? And so that's just one of the costs. And then the other cost is the, you know, another cost is this idea that, you know, when you're using the data, you're, you're, um, you're contributing to data set decay. And so if it, you know, in, there's going to be a lot of projects where it doesn't make sense, right? For you know, for any kind of you know random researcher to contribute data because it depends on what the sample is and you know how it you know they you know there's lots of there's lots of details about how things are run, um, but I think it's kind of a cool idea. 
Um, and I could see certain cases and it would, the other thing that it would do is it would really push the, the original projects to be highly reproducible, right? Because in order for you to be able to do that as a, as a researcher, they, they're going to need to tell you exactly how to go collect the data set so that you can reasonably contribute it back. Um, and I think that would be a, you know, obviously, you know, projects like ABCD have had to do that because they're replicated across many different sites. Um, but I think it would be kind of, you know, more generally kind of cool for projects to, um, you know, when they share their data, share enough details that somebody else could go, like share all the tasks and, you know, all the other details. So somebody else could go and, and run it uh, in their own site. Yeah, I guess a follow up to these ideas, you know, it does not have to be like a monetary tool, right? It's like, if we can force you to upload your data set before downloading everyone else's data set. So that would be a, a another cool idea, right? just just a follow up. Yeah, yeah, right. That you have to basically, you you get some kind of points for uploading data and you, you need to pay points in order to download data. The, I mean, the, you know, the, the downside of that is that there's a lot of people out there who take advantage of shared data who never collect data on their own, right? As, you know, computational researchers, people in, you know, uh, Global South or other places who basically can't, you know, don't have the resources to collect data, but still have the resources to analyze data. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't necessarily want to do that, but maybe there's some other way that, you know, people could, you know, sort of pay into the system. I mean, fortunately, we don't have to do that right now. Um, but, uh, but I think it's, it's an interesting idea. You know, following on that, and I know Priya, you have your hand up, but this is related to the same discussion. And we definitely don't ever do anything illegal, but um, if this reminds me of those torrenting sites where like you earn credits by uploading or you can pay right. for them, or you just wait for things to be free to torrent. Um, and there's like several different ways that you can engage with some or all of the data that's available, you could conceivably come up with a similar system that has multiple ways of, of buying in that can still provide some level of resources to the groups that don't have the ability to pay in, but then the, the whales, I guess, they can, they can earn it in some way, right. you know? Right, yeah, right. People can start paying for their data with Bitcoin. That is cool. And let me just add that I also think it would be uh, probably very um, impactful for reducing decay if you just prevent only publishing, I guess. So uh, because I guess the published results are the ones that have the most impact on or no, that doesn't count. It doesn't actually reduce the statistical ah, spreads that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Priya, you, you have your hand up. Uh... Hi, thanks. Hey. Um, yeah, and Savannah, no problem, because mine is a different topic. So, um, Russ, thanks for being here. Um, I was watching the video of your talk from last year, and kind of the first two thirds of it gives you this feeling of almost um, having a crisis of faith, like, oh my God, none of this means anything. What are we even doing? Um, and I was thinking, I'm glad that towards the end, you know, we talked about, okay, what are some things we can do? Like, I think the multiverse idea makes a lot of sense and uh, pre-registration and standardizing. Yeah, like you were saying, standardizing, pre-processing, um, things like that. I started to wonder, okay, so we have this kind of uh, replicability crisis in neuroimaging and psychology, probably if they looked at it in sociology or economics, I don't know if they've been cared, but I was thinking, do you think that this is a problem in particular for certain fields or disciplines? And I was thinking, yeah, I mean, I guess when you do have that analytic flexibility, which you may not have in the quote, hard sciences, that would definitely be a factor. Um, so that's my question. Do you think some of it is discipline specific? And if so, why? Um, and I think that the problem is actually really broad, right? You know, the fact, you know, one of the earliest demonstrations came out of cancer biology, where a couple of, you know, companies tried to go back and replicate a bunch of published studies from the cancer biology literature and found that they could only replicate, I think, on the order of like a quarter or a third of them. You know, there's been things in the geosciences there, you know, it's not just about psychology or neuroscience, right? It's a, it's a really broad thing. Um, 
so what and uh, there's almost certainly factors that will kind of drive it and actually you know john yoanidas as i talked about i think in the talk he wrote this paper back in 2005 that actually laid out what he thought some of those factors were um i think you know one of the biggest factors is um the use of null hypothesis statistical testing right because it it basically encourages these sort of degenerate behaviors around like you know trying to find significant results you know whereas like if you're you know there are some areas of science where the goal is to get like precise estimates of a particular like you want to know like what's the what's the width of an atom right and apparently there's like big debates about like the width of particular atoms um you'd think that that like the width of a hydrogen atom would be known but apparently it's there's debate um but you know the, at least in those areas you know it's it's not about like hey i found a result because this thing you know went right under 0.05 it's like hey i you know came up with a new model and it provides me a way to get more precise estimates and make you know more precise predictions um so that, i think that's part of it is you know i think that null hypothesis testing is you know is just a, a fundamentally problematic way to do science um i think the other thing that is a big issue it just has to do with um the size of the data and the complexity of the analysis right and this is going back exactly to what yoanita said is like you know the 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 more data you have um the especially the more variables you're looking at the more you can you know find things right and if you don't exert the right type of control um, then, you know, you can have inflated false positive rates. And then to the degree that you have, you know, a higher rate of, uh, or higher lands, a, a broader landscape of analyses, right. That just provides people with more things to try. Um, and even without kind of, you know, intentional P hacking, um, you know, it's clear that one can, you know, make data dependent decisions that can have impact on, you know, on ultimate false positive rates. Um, so I think it's certainly, you know, I think that, you know, psychology has actually been at the forefront of actually tackling it. Unlike some other, like, you know, they, they tried to do a replication pro reproducibility project in cancer biology, and they couldn't even get the project off the ground because they couldn't even figure out like how to replicate a bunch of the, of the, the particular studies. Um, and so I think that we've, you know, tried to tackle the problem and have been sort of more forthright than a lot of other fields though it's you know there are now that i'm you know we, we've got this new effort on campus here the center for open and reproducible science it's really trying to bring open science to the entire campus and so you know i'm talking like you know there's a person i talked to who does like research on wastewater treatment and they're like trying to move into you know open science there because they have reproducibility problems and so it's uh i think it's 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 actually a really broad issue that's kind of reassuring in a way. So just to follow up, so that's interesting. You know, if we're moving away from null hypothesis testing, it's almost like we have to try and think about our research questions in different ways than we're used to thinking about them. Yep, that's exactly right. Um, and I think, you know, there's there's lots of ways to think about that. One is to think about, you know, um, you know, bringing theory to the fore and models to the fore more than we do now, rather than, you know, right now, most imaging papers are like, you know, hey, we had, you know, we had this particular manipulation we did, and we went to see if particular brain areas, you know, showed engagement, or, you know, if they showed patterns of activity where we can predict something, right, there's, there's this kind of flavor of paper that's really about like, hey, we did this thing, and we got this result, without any kind of precise prediction other than, hey, maybe we think there might be activity, we expect there's going to be activity in the hippocampus for this particular manipulation. And hey, we got activity in, in the hippocampus, even though it's not the same voxels we saw in the other study. But you know, um, there's, I think there's, you know, that's, I think that's a kind of science that, you um, well, that I don't do anymore because I think it's broken. Um, and I think we do need new models for thinking about how to um, how to do it. Great. Let, let me uh, direct traffic here a little bit because there are plenty of you who have your hands up. Uh, I think Eric, I think you were first. Thanks, Ariel. Um, hey, Russ. <laughs> hey. I uh, was wondering, uh, what kind of advice would you offer for people trying to incorporate more reproducible practices, like you mentioned, um, 
code review, software testing, software engineering style things in their labs day to day. Like, like what, what do you feel is a sustainable way for a lab to do that while still being able to do their science and, and other things? Yeah, it's really tricky, right? Because I mean, there's there's such deep rabbit holes that one can go down around these things and end up like having no time to you know to get anything any actual research done because you're you're worried about making everything as perfectly engineered and reproducible as possible. So you have to you have to find this kind of sweet spot. Um, and I think that you know the there's a I think there's a few things one can do that can have a pretty big impact. I think, you know, building, like really building version control into how you do things is probably the biggest one. Um, in part because it's not, I mean, it does help with reproducibility, I think, but it mostly just helps you be a more effective, uh, you know, computational researcher. Um, I think the learning a little bit about, you know, code, like how to write quality code, just simple stuff like how to think about naming variables, right? Um, so I, I can't remember if I mentioned last year, this book, The Art of Readable Code, um, which I think is a really good starting point for, you know, it's a, it's a relatively short, relatively light book on um, how to write better code. And there, you'll walk away with, you know, with a lot of different things. And then I think starting to work code review into one's lab regularly is, is probably another kind of pretty high value thing. And it's it's high value not just because it you know helps you find potential bugs in code that that's that hasn't been the most important aspect of it for us I think the most important aspect of it for us has been that it it lets the people in the group who are not as highly skilled really see how the craft works right and sort of learn things that you that are much harder to learn when you're just kind of writing code on your own and like Googling sort of stack overflow to find out, you know, why you're getting a particular error. Um, I, I think for us that that's probably been the most important thing is it really, and people have made that comment to me um, that, you know, that they've learned, like I actually had, you know, one, there was a grad student in the lab who just took a job in industry basically as a data scientist. And she basically said, you know, that she would not have gotten the job had it not been for what she learned doing code reviews with the lab. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Hedda, I believe you were next with your hand up. Yes, um, so my question was a little bit more technical. I wanted to know what factors contribute towards a data set decaying. Um, the it's basically you know just the degree to which you know lots of people are reusing the data and testing lots of individual hypotheses without controlling you know for the number of times that they've been tested or the number of questions that have been asked or so the idea behind data set decay is simply that you know let's think about you know you could let, let's you know the example that we used in that paper was you know like one, let's say that you want to know about the relationship between, um, you know, white matter, like, uh, sorry, gray matter thickness and um, some behavioral measure. And, you know, HCP has say like 70 behavioral measures, right? So you can imagine that one, one researcher would come and say, hey, we're going to, we're going to test all 70 of those against all however many, you know, areas in the brain for, for correlations. Um, and we're going to control for all of those tests, right? And so there you would expect to get a false positive rate one out of five, what, sorry, one out of uh, 20 times, right? If you're, if you're correcting it at P less than 0.05. Um, you could also imagine that 70 different groups could each take the same data, but only test one hypothesis, right? One of the 70 measures, right? And write a paper about that and just control for type one error on that one uh, on that one measure, right? Um, and now you've got a false positive rate of, you know, 0.5 times uh, 70. You, you expect that, you know, some three or four of those papers are going to be false positives, right? Whereas if one group had done all the things at once, you would only have a 5% chance of that one paper being a false positive. So that's the basic idea. So then, you're up next. Sorry, my mute button is not playing nice today. Um, 
Uh, so I feel like, um, and having now had a year and a half to work off of other people's data, this is much more in sharp relief than it even is normally. But I feel like an elephant in the room that a lot of times doesn't get talked about is the fact that our primary method of communication is through articles and those written method sections, the ability to reproduce things that people have already done is so strongly dependent on how clearly and completely and effectively they communicate what their original methods already were. Um, and there's not really been a lot of discussion that I've seen of like, actually, how would we document our methodologies just from like the top down and how would we communicate them across papers in a way that gets away from this like make your journal article as short as possible fit in with the publication requirements first and foremost rather than communicating what we've done what do you think about that whole issue yeah i mean i think i probably used this quote from david donahoe in my talk right that the paper about a computational result is advertising right you know that the real result is the code and the data and the platform that was used to run everything um and so i think that the only way we can really solve that problem is to have all of those objects that were needed to to generate the research right uh, for us that's relatively straightforward right compared to somebody who has like you know is like growing cell lines and doing like wet stuff in a lab right then they have to have like special agreements to share all this stuff at least we can generally just share the code we can usually share the data in some particular way um so i think we're, we're actually the the the, the kind of end-to-end, -end, mostly end-to-end -end digital nature of neuroimaging makes, a, it makes it somewhat easier for us to be able to do that. But I think that the only way we can address that is to have the code be shared and have it shared in a way that's, you know, that's, that's reproducible, right? So if it, you know, we've all probably had this experience of somebody saying, hey, the code is available and you go look at it and it's just, you know, like a, like a big hairball, right? Um, it's not really very useful. So I think, you know, that it takes some, some additional work to, to make that happen. And, and the problem is that lots of researchers don't have the skills or the time to, to make that stuff happen. And so I think that the only way we can really kind of effectively make that sort of thing happen is to build those things in from the beginning, right? To make sure that, you know, that, because, you know, having to go back and make your stuff reproducible after you've done it, it pretty much means it's not going to happen, right? So I think that the the way to make it happen is to build in reproducibility from the very beginning. That's what that's you know that's what I try to do now, at least in the work that I do personally. I mean, I don't, you know, when people in the lab are doing their work, I'm not kind of in their face about, you know, can can it, is there a button? Is there one command I can run and have everything go happen and that's going to spit out a result for me? Um, so, um, you know, because there's just, you know, people have time constraints. Um, so I think it's an aspiration, but it's a challenging aspiration to actually achieve. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I think to some degree, at least the Kobe Das effort was related to this issue that you mentioned about how, what, what do we need to write in the paper so that there's clarity about yeah. what happened yeah. and yeah. sort of, clarifying the terminology and so on. Though, you know, I'll add, so for, for the NARP study, you know, we had everybody give us a covid -OS compliant description of their methods. And there were many cases where we could not tell what they had done without actually getting the detailed code that, you know, like for their model, we had to get their FSL design files to know exactly what they had done. Um, well, I want to add one other comment before we before we move on to, to Savannah's question, which is, you know, I think that there's, we have to think about like, you know, what's the what's the cost benefit analysis of doing this sort of stuff, right? That there's there's going to be some places where, you know, the errors are going to happen, right? And the question is, what's the cost of an error, right? And if my paper is a paper that's basically saying, hey, you know, we should start doing, you know, TMS to treat disease X, um, and here's my result that shows that. I think that that's a case where an error could have a serious implication, right? It could change what people do in clinics and change people's lives. Um, whereas if I'm saying, hey, you know, I think that um, that there's this particular thing that the hippocampus does um, that's done by CA1 and not the dentate gyrus, you know, if if that's an error, it's obviously it's not good, but it's not going to be as costly an error for the world 
as um, as something that sort of influences public policy or influences uh, medical treatment. So I think we do have to, th given that we're not going to be able to, to put you know these sort of resources in for everything, thinking about like what are the what would the cost of an error be, and kind of really focusing on you know the places where that uh, that could be you know uh, important. Yeah, my advisor always says we're not curing cancer here. <laughs> Alberto, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, hi. First of all, thank you for, for this space. So I was wondering, you in the in the first part of part of your talk, you were talking about how how hard it is to have reliable results when working with very small data sets. But there are some fields or in some situations where you can really have more than that. Sometimes you know you don't have money for having more subjects or your sample is simply too limited because of the nature of the problem. So, what what are the the best practices in those cases? Yeah. Um, so, I think a couple of ways to think about that. I mean, so you, but there, there's going to be some questions that you just can't answer, right? So, for example, in particular, um, questions about group differences or individual differences. You know, you just can't answer in the way that we generally answer them with a small sample. I think that that's what, that's what we've learned, right? So the question is like, you know, what can you, what questions can you answer, right? And I think that, you know, we can take a, um, we can take a guide from, you know, people who do a visual neuroscience, right? Where you look at papers in visual neuroscience, they often have three or four subjects, right? And they've, and one of the reasons that they can do that, right? Is because the system that they're characterizing is I think in general, Ariel can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's much better behaved and much more consistent across individuals than like say trying to study social cognition or something like that, right? But the, but the point remains that, you know, if you can characterize each individual in much more detail and, you know, fit precise models to behavior and make predictions about the imaging that are much more detailed, you can, you can in some cases get by with much smaller numbers of individuals. Now the inference looks different, right? It's not saying, we did a t test across these five people and got a p less than 0.5. It's basically saying, "Hey, look, here's this result that we find in all five of these people, and we and it's not the result isn't just this voxel was significantly active. The result is like you know, hey, we see this functional form in the response to a particular type of manipulation. So I think that you know, it's it's this idea of kind of going deeper on each individual rather than trying to pull out more individuals. I think that those are that that's probably the the, you know, the, the best way to think about it. And that's kind of what the, like, if you think about like how do people who study individuals with lesions uh, go about it, right? If you look at like, you know, patient HM is the most famous one, right? Who, you know, had this memory deficit following surgery in the 19, late 1950s, I think. And he was studied for like 40 years, right? Um, just doing all this different stuff on him. And that, you know, sort of over time built up a, a real, you know, a characterization that let us learn something important, even though it was only you know, sort of one person. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. No, I'll just I'll just okay. add to that. But I, I think the the sort of I've heard this this um, sort of comparison to vision um, in many cases, and I think what's interesting now is that uh, people in 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 neighboring fields are looking over and saying, maybe this approach actually does apply in what we're doing. And the Midnight Scan Club is, is one example. And then your work on um, your uh, uh, many recordings of your own connectome is an example where maybe we wouldn't have expected it to be so fruitful to take nine subjects and look at them in a lot of detail, but it turns out, yeah, when you do that, look at real detail, you find really interesting um, single subject. Um, yeah, yeah. Results. And I think that you can also, you know, like the recent work from Rod Braga and Randy Buckner, right, which has shown that basically by doing this kind of detailed individual analysis, they actually found aspects of like, you know, resting state organization that had never been seen in the group studies. And it took looking at and or in, you know, my connectome because we were doing or midnight scan clubs, we were doing different types of analyses. So I think there's a there's a lot of uh, mileage to be gotten out of those sort of approaches. Priya, I see you. your, your hand is, is still up. Uh, I wonder if it's still up because you haven't taken it down from before. If you have another question. I'm oh, mistaken. Uh, Kai, you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Russ, for, for your time being with us. And uh, um, I 
I heard that you briefly mentioned about researchers uh, have time constraints, and which is very true. And my, my question might sound a little bit provocative, uh, but do you think that researchers, especially early career researchers like, like us, uh, sometimes don't have time to reproduce? Because, and, and, and part of the reason is because the academic system puts so much emphasis on the numbers of papers to publish. And it seems that it's getting worse to some degrees that we have to sometimes choose a journal that can get the result out there. It is not that we don't want to do best practice. And I, I like every idea that is mentioned out there and all these amazing tools that is available, which is why I'm here to learn all of this. But, um, uh, but maybe it's putting this in a slightly different perspective. In, uh, with, with all your efforts of promoting this is it, it and my question is like do you think is there something that the it, it maybe it is taking a little bit slow is that part of the reason maybe it is a little bit slow and and what's your advice for earlier career researchers thank you yeah no it, 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 I mean, this is a really great question i actually and i'll before i start talking i'm gonna uh, maybe Ariel can send this around to people. I wrote a, a short paper a couple of years ago called The Cost of Reproducibility, which basically was trying to address exactly this issue. And so um, I'll say a couple of things, but then you know I'd suggest that you have a look at that paper. Um, and it also addresses actually the, the question that, that just came up from Alberto about you know, what do you do if you can't sort of you know, collect enough data. Um, so you're exactly right that the incentives are not aligned between you know, career progress and good science. That the things that are incentivized now for getting faculty jobs um, are you know, basically right, publishing as much as you can in the fanciest journals you can. And that is necessarily gonna be easier if you can you know, sort of p-hack your way to a better paper, if you can kind of you know, leave out the things from the paper that make it not look so clean. You know, there's all the things that we think people probably do, and actually people report doing in these surveys of questionable research practices. You know, are incentivized by the current uh, the current environment, um, and so you know, I think that one of the things that one has to ask oneself is like, you know, do you you know, is that the world you want to live in, right? Um, and, uh, and of course, if you, you know, if you can't get a job, then, you know, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but, uh, but it's, you know, it's, and, and so I, you know, I have to also say, this is a really challenging question for me, because I got my job, you know, by doing research the way that we started doing it 20 years ago, which I would never do now, because, you know, I know all the things that we were doing that were wrong, right. And so, um, so I don't want to be viewed as like, you know, pulling up the ladder, right? By saying basically to all of you, you now have to do all this impossible stuff, right? That's never going to get you a job. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's the stuff that we know in the end is going to avoid the kind of problems that we've seen to plague, you know, our field. Um, so all that is to say that I, you know, it's, it's really hard for me to know what answer to give to you, right? I think you have to do the things that you're comfortable with. You have to kind of adopt as many of the practices as you can within the resources and the time you have, right? Um, but um, but I you know I think you know I and my colleagues in the you know who focus on these reproducibility questions realize the bind that all of you are in because the incentive. So one of the things that you know that many of us have been thinking about is how do we change those incentive structures. Um, there's a, and, and a lot of that has to come from the top. So right at Stanford now, at least in the, the job searches in psychology, one that we're gonna be putting out in neuroscience shortly, we actually include in the ad um, that you know, we, we, um, we value uh, open science and reproducibility and we'd like for candidates to describe in their research statement the ways in which their research practices have tried to incorporate those, those aspects, right? So that at least signals that this is an important thing. And, and I've been, and again, you know, Stanford is, I think, a, 
maybe a slightly weird place. We're a little bit of a bubble because of the particular people who are here. But um, but I've been on search committees where the person who was at the top of the list in the beginning of the search ended up being struck because after looking at their work, you know, we just became convinced that a lot of it was not going to be reproducible um, because of the, even though they had papers, the person who in this particular search, the person who got the job didn't have papers that were in as fancy journals, right? Um, but it, they had pre-registered stuff. We looked at their work and it really it looked much more solid. Um, and I hope that that's starting to happen elsewhere. Um, there's also work, so there's a committee that was started by the, the National Academies of Science and Medicine in the US um, that it was, it was called something like the Round Table on Aligning Incentives for Open Science. And basically what they've done is put together a report that's been sent around to like the presidents of universities, basically saying reproducibility and open science are an important problem the National Academy says it is, thus it is. Um, and they've actually been talking about this for a few years. And they're basically basically trying to tell, tell university presidents, how do you go about changing your campus so that the incentives are in favor of reproducible research and open science practices? And obviously that's, that's, a, that's gonna take a lot of work because you know, universities are very big ships, they turn very slowly. Um, but this is pressure from an organization that actually has leverage, right? Um, and so the hope is that, you know, by the time many of you are, you know, applying for jobs some number of years down the road, there will have been at least some movement on these issues. That's, you know, unfortunately, that's the best I can do is to say that it's, you know, that we're really, you know, like I, at, you know, at Stanford, you know, I'm this part of the, the reason we started this new center was to be able to kind of create across campus Kind of a community and a movement around around open science practices um and I, the one the other thing i think i would say is that you're fortunate to be in a field where i think you know neuroimaging is way ahead of lots of other fields um, in uh, the adoption of open science and reproducible research practices and so you're lucky in that sense if you were in a field where you know 95 of the people think this is all like crazy talk then you know it, it would it would be a lot harder than it is, and not saying that it's not hard, but it could be a lot harder. Um, sorry, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, I was wondering how, whether you thought that the fact that most results that get published are significant also hinders progress, because it's also hard to eliminate hypotheses if you don't know what has been disproven. Yeah, no, I think it's a huge problem. Um, and the, I mean, it's, you know, the whole the whole issue of, publishing null results is challenging, right? Because there's a lot of reasons a result could be null, right? It could be null because, you know, there are null 20% of the time, even when you have sufficient power, they're null because somebody didn't know how to do the experiment, right? There's lots of reasons that, you know, a null result doesn't mean that the, that the idea is wrong necessarily, right? Uh, you get a few of them, uh, you start to think that, that they are, um, but, but on the flip side, you know, I think that the that this the the failure to publish null results is really pernicious. So I had a, a grad student. This is a number of years ago, grad student in my lab who spent several years basically working on a question, basically trying to take some published results and sort of extend them, um, and uh, then realized that the basic result that they've been trying to build on for the last year. They couldn't even, when they tried to go back and they had assumed that the basic result was fine. They went back and tried to replicate the basic result and that they've been trying to build on and they couldn't. And then we started talking to other groups and it turns out that two other groups had also failed to replicate that basic result, but hadn't published their null results. And so, you know, you get lots of people basically banging their head against the wall for years. He ended up basically leaving science because he, in part because of the frustrations around you know, this whole experience. Um, so I, I think that despite the challenges of knowing, you know, how, how the best way is to do it, we have to figure out a way to do it. Uh, hey, Jung, I see your, your hand up here. Yes. Uh, so I had a question um, sort of related to Kai's point where um, as early entry level researchers, I'm sure like everybody here sort of is definitely on board with the idea of um, 
reproducibility and open science and we all embody the idea you know that's probably why we're all here so that's probably like hope in the field but um pre-registering your hypothesis and, and this was personally from my own experience you're you quickly encounter that you're limited by your ability as an entry-level researcher and you don't know the whole field of um, the analysis that you're going to run you know most of the time we're learning just starting out to learn a new analysis and we're trying to apply it to the data or sometimes you're collecting a data over across two years and by the time you have the data you're already grown and you have better ideas so mm -hmm. I wonder what thoughts you have about that, um, especially in some advice for entry level people. Yeah, I mean, pre, the pre-registration definitely gets much more difficult as the complexity of the research gets higher, right? So if you're, you know, if you were just, let's say you're a social psychologist and you wanna test a particular hypothesis about, you know, social priming, you, you do your task, your analysis is like a T test across two groups or something like that. Um, and you're done, right? Whereas for us in neuroimaging, yeah, there's you know there's such complexity, um, and and you never know upfront exactly what's going to happen. Even if you're a skill, you know, even if you've have years of experience, you're you're always going to run into things that were different than you know kind of what you expected. And so we've come to, I guess I would say two things, right? One is that, you know, um, pre-registration isn't meant to be a straight jacket, right? It's really meant to be more like a, a, a plan, right? And we know that plans change based on what happens in the world. And the question is, like, it's really meant to kind of help you remember, help you kind of, you know, keep yourself honest about what you intended to do, right? And not make you're going to have to make data dependent decisions, but you don't want to make data dependent decisions that are, are likely to end up, you know, so for example, you know, let's say that you started out thinking there was going to be, you know, uh, activity in the hippocampus for a particular manipulation on your task. And then it turns out that, you know, there was active, there was a, you know, difference in the singular, but not on the hippocampus. And, you know, you say, well, you know, we, we probably would have expected it in the singulate because we know the singulate is connected to the hippocampus and there was this other paper that had shown it in the singulate, right? Um, it's very easy in retrospect to kind of convince yourself of what you might have thought, you know, two years ago when you started putting the study together. So for me, the main reason to do pre-registration is to keep yourself honest in the future because you're not going to be able to remember all the things that were in your head when you were planning the study. So, you know, we've never published a study that was pre-registered without having a fairly long list of deviations from the pre-registration, even for behavioral stuff that's sort of more complex. Um, you know, we, we will often have, you know, deviations. And, and I think that's fine. When I review a paper, I don't have a problem with deviations as long as the deviations are kind of reasonably motivated. Um, and and I, I think most other people, you know, I hope most other reviewers will get behind that. I, you know, the problem is that, you know, different people view these things differently. And some people, I think, have come to think of pre-registration as basically like, you know, if you don't do exactly what, what was in the pre-registration, then you're a criminal, right? And I think that that's an unfortunate, you know, sort of absolutist view on pre-registration that, um, that interferes with its ability to actually help us do better science. Let's take Thank one you. last question, uh, Paul. I, I think uh, someone else was, was first before me, if, if you wanna. Oh. I, I can go if, if she, she asked her question. I oh, she did. Okay. Um, oh, she was the last. Um, so I had a question sort of based on that last one about sort of going off the rails of a pre-registration in that I've had situations where going off the off the beaten track of the pre-registration is going into those these sort of multiverse analyses that you were talking about and sort of iteratively adding more to the multiverse and seeing what happens when you add more things to the multiverse. But then it feels like the multiverse is just an exploration of lots and lots and lots of different deviations from a pre-registration and feeling like it's, it's very, this very large unplanned thing. Have you had that situation and how do you, how do you deal with knowing where, how to deal with an, an unplanned multiverse or um, knowing, knowing when to stop or when to not stop? Yeah, we haven't had exactly that situation, but it's certainly, you know, it, it, sounds like something we will run into at some point in the near future. Um, 
I, you know, I think in some ways, as long as the paper adequately represents the exploratory nature of the analyses, then I think that's fine. You know, I mean, if we didn't have exploration, then we're not going to discover anything new, right? So we, so I, I, you know, I wrote a blog post a few years ago about, you know, how it was titled something like why pre-registration no longer scares me or something like that. Um, and I, you know, it, and in part, the problem was early advocates of pre-registration were very down on exploration. And I think exploration is really important. And I think that we just have to be clear in the paper. Well, one, we have to be clear in the paper, you know, is there, um, you know, what was planned, what was exploration? And to the degree that it's possible to hold out some data where you can validate whatever exploration you do, that's the best possible world, right? And as data sets, especially if you're working with shared data, you often have enough data to do that. So I, so that's what we've started doing is often like putting in uh, into our uh, pre-registration, we're going to have a, you know, a, a exploration data, like a discovery data set and a validation data set, right? We're going to basically just torture the discovery data set. Um, and then we're going to come back and pre-register the analyses we will do on the validation data set um, and, you know, test them in the end.